Welcome to the second uh, in the classification of marine life. We're going to enter Kingdom Animalia and take a look at the invertebrate phyla of animals. When you take a look at the tree given to you on this page, um, you can see that scientists postulate that protists are the ancestors of the animal. The first separator is the tissues. The porifera sponges don't have true tissues. They operate on a cellular level. As you move up the tree, you see that symmetry is the next divider, radial or round versus bilateral. The presence of the siloam or body cavity full of organs is the next level of organization. And segmentation and deuterostomes, protosomes are the final divider. So let's run through what all this means. We learned that, you know, cells, tissues, organs is, uh, organism is uh, how organisms are set up. So when you're on the cellular level, like sponges, you don't have groups of cells working together to perform a function as a unit. You have different cells carrying out the activities. So that's the first division, sponges, the simplest. Then it, with tissues, say the cnidaria, they have nerve nets. They have a digestive, a, a simple digestive system, one opening. Uh, so they operate on a more complex level. Our tube within a tube, digestive, bilaterally symmetric worms, another level. A organ cavity full of organs like the mollusks, echinoderms, annelids show, next level. Then you have the uh, division of embryonic development, protostomes and deuterostomes, another level. So looking at this development, uh, they developed the same way early on through cleavage. You notice that the uh, protostomes uh, are dividing asymmetrically and the deuteral stomes are dividing symmetrically. As the body cavity forms, you can see it forms from different locations. That mesoderm, that internal a uh, layer of cells is what forms our body organs. The blastropore is the opening to our digestive system. The mouth is the first to develop in the primitive. The anus is the first to develop in the more advanced method. Uh, in the end, you wind up with a bilateral organism with mesoderm body cavity endoderm digestive system and uh, the external ectoderm uh, muscles and skin. So uh, the development is very similar except the deuterostomes develop in a different order and the tissue comes from a different location in the embryo. Now to start with the organisms themselves. Sponges lack true tissues. They're the simplest. They belong to phyrum porifera. So they're sedentary as adults. They don't move. They don't have a mouth, organs. They filter food in through their pores, oxygen in through their pores. They are a colony of cells. They secrete a substance called spongin that is like a mesh that holds it together. They lack true tissues. They are sexual reproduction, broadcast spawning. They can regenerate broken if you cut them in half. They can grow into two separate sponges because their complexity is low. Their base cell has a flagella that beats back and forth. It's called a collar cell. 
that creates water flow and allows the cells to absorb oxygen and engulf food. Barrel sponges are common. Vase sponges are very common as well, often wash up to shore. Tube sponges are also common on the reef and in our areas. The finger sponges are another species of sponge. You can see uh, the parasitic boring sponge uh, leaves little holes on a shell. Also, you see that young man wearing that fancy cap. Well, that's actually a piece of a vase sponge. So we do get sponges that wash up the shore here quite often. They reproduce sexually, broadcast spawning, and they can also regenerate or bud. So they are capable of asexual reproduction as well. Very simple organisms, the simplest in kingdom Animalia. Some are toxins. They, 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 they fight off enemies with their toxins. We can get a rash called swimmer's itch if you uh, rush, rub up against the uh, wrong sponges. We use these chemicals in uh, some medicines. The next phylum, Cnidaria, is characterized by cnidocytes or stinging cells. They're radially symmetric, sac-like, two cell layers, have a body opening, so they don't have the salome, they don't have mesoderm. They have the nematocysts, ring of tentacles. We talked about the two bodies, the polyp and the medusa before. Polyp, generally benthic, mouth and tentacles up. Medusa, generally planktonic, mouth, tentacles down. Some of them alternate. Their sexual stages of the medusa so they can get around and, and meet other medusas. And their uh, adult stage is polyp where they're sessile and feed. Others are broadcast spawners where they spermate into the water column. Some are jellyfish for life. So they have a variety of life cycles. The uh, physiology though is a simple nerve net that gives them a sense of touch. They can reproduce through spawning, which would be sexual, or budding, which would be asexual. So they have that alternation of generation as well. They have the stinging cells called nematocysts, nitocysts, I should say nitocytes, that um, are like little harpoons. The class anthozoa are polyps for life, the coral anemones, they broadcast spawn. Coral can be hermatypic, which means it has zooxanthellae. We learned last time that's type of dinoflagellate living in their tissue. They need light, they need shallow water. Those are the reef building corals. The ahermatypic corals are the soft corals. They can be found anywhere. They don't build reefs. They're the sea whips and sea fans. They don't need to have warm tropical water like the hermatypic corals. So there's actually two types of corals. The reef corals, which have an algae in them, and the non-reef building corals, which do not. So there's some reef building corals right there. You have some pillar coral and staghorn, elkhorn, brain coral, mushroom coral, all that's reef building, that's all hermatypic. Those are found in the Caribbean reef track. Your ahermatypic coral then, they are also called octocoral because each polyp has eight tentacles. They don't have the algae and they can be found worldwide. Examples are the uh, sea fans, sea feathers, sea whips. You can see that beautiful trumpet fish hiding in a grove of coral in the lower uh, portion of the, the image. So they're coral, they're polyps, they don't build reefs. Coral reproduces by broadcast spawning on the lunar cycle, sperm and egg into the tides. 
Anatomies are polyps. That's the Caribbean pink tick anatomy photographed in the Florida Keys. That, and the bottom one was taken from the internet. I've seen them in the Florida Keys myself. We have anemones up here as well, but they're not quite as uh, elaborate. Scyphozoa, the true jellyfish, are basically jellyfish for life. Uh, the example, the moon jellyfish above, common here, you can see there's symbiotic fish called the medusa fish living them. Mangrove jellies live upside down in the mangrove swamps. They live upside down because they have algae growing on their tentacles, and that is a symbiote. So they're kind of like algae farmers on their own body. Sea nettles, these were taken right there at Fort DeSoto, are stinging nettles or sea nettles. They're jellyfish, very common in our area. Hydrozoa alternate between their polyp and the medusa, like we uh, mentioned that's an alternation of generation. The gametes are medusa. They, they go around for re reproduction. Siphonophores are colonial cnidaria made of different types of cells living together. They're called zooids. They're modified polyps. Fire coral has very, very long stinging cells, nematocysts cnidocysts that um, give you big welts. By the wind sailor is another siphonophore. It's a colony of zooids. The cubozoa, the box jellyfish, is one of the most poisonous organisms in the world. It lives in Australia, mate, and they have the simplest eye in the animal kingdom. So this is useless trivia. There's its eyes in the picture. You can see below the structure of the eye. Uh, so they have an organ. Most in this farm don't have organs. They, they operate on the tissue level with the nerve, gnat, and things. But this actually has an organ, the eye. Phylum tenophora, the comb jellies, used to be in the same phylum with the cnidarians except they do not have the stingers, they do not have the ring of tentacles, so they are certainly not cnidarius, but they have the jelly-like body, so they were thrown in there in, by early taxonomists. Uh, they are bioluminescent, they attract plankton, eat them. Uh, they're also referred to as sea acorns. You can see on the right that was a uh, plankton toe that we got at Weedon Island, and uh, the left shows an image uh, museum quality with the bioluminescent to attract the plankton. Now there's a plethora of marine worms to go through. The worms display the environment of bilateral symmetry and then the acelomate, the pseudo or partial coelomate, and the coelome itself. They also develop segmentation. So a lot of animal innovations occur across the worm taxa. Uh, the pogonophore is an interesting marine worm. They live on the deep sea floor. They lack a digestive system. They live near hydrothermal vents. They absorb nutrients. They have bacteria living in their skin. This bacteria chemosynthesizes. <clears throat> so they are the trees of the forest, except they're big worms, six to eight feet long, chemosynthesizing on the bottom of the ocean. Life is strange. Chediagnatha are arrow worms. They're planktonic. Uh, they're open ocean. We're not going to see them. Annelids are the most numerous of the marine worms. Uh, they have closed circulatory system, hemoglobin blood. Uh, earthworms are the, the most familiar, but in the ocean, we have a variety of them. Uh, Fireworms, sandworms, feather duster, Christmas tree worms are, are among the different worms that, that are present in the ocean. Clam worms are also. Here's egg casings in the seagrass bed of some uh, 
marine worms, polychaete worms, so uh, they're very common. When we're out there, summertime, seagrass beds are lush, we'll wade through. Uh, you will certainly see a lot of these just in there, the egg casings. This is a manatee grass community. I can see the wire-like grass in the Fort DeSoto uh, Arrowhead Flats. Again, when you go to Arrowhead Flats and you're tooling around out there knee deep in water, I'm not sure what sea grasses you're gonna walk through. The deeper you go, uh, the more you'll move from shoal to manatee to turtle. So say you go waist deep, you'll probably find some turtle grass. Uh, ankle deep, you'll certainly see manatee grass and then certainly see shoal grass. And then that transition between will have this wire-like manatee grass. Mollusks. There's five classes, two, two are very small. The uh, chitinous polyplacophora and scapezoa, the tush shells, they're rare. We don't even, I mean, we run into them so randomly. Uh, bivalves, gastropods, most common, cephalopods, coolest in my opinion. So the, the, that's a picture of Marathon Beach, it's limestone. Uh, honeycomb weathering because it dissolves in the water. And in those little cups, you'll see a lot of chitin. There's a chitin in the uh, image, as well as the honeycomb weathering. That is the segmented mollusk. That is the link between mollusk and annelid. Uh, the tusk shells, I've found a couple on the beach. They're, they break, they're so uh, fragile. The little tusk, uh, they're such a insignificant, unless of course you happen to be a member of, of this class, insignificant little class in, in marine science. The bivalves are very significant. We see them all the time, two-part shell. Uh, filter feeders, for the most part, there is the giant clam, which uh, gardens actually grows algae on its tissues and lays open in the light. Occasionally, I mean, they, they filter feed. That's, that's, how they, that's how they live. Uh, Bivalves and most mollusks have this broadcast fertilization for a trochophore larva, ciliated, grows into a mini from a veliger to, to spat, which is really mini uh, bivalve that's planktonic, it's so small. And when it gets larger, it settles into its benthic lifestyle. Base scallops are that indicator species that we've mentioned. You've seen this image before, it's a good one. We've also seen images I took with cool blue eyes in, in one of the recent uh, field videos, or if you haven't, you will shortly, that we uh, pulled out of Fort DeSoto. Shipworms, this is a neat little bivalve that they're the termites of the sea, they eat wood. And uh, oh goodness, the old ships that uh, the explorers would take that are made of wood, the shipworms would uh, wear away at their ship, drill, drill right into them, shipworms. That piece was washed up on the Fort DeSoto. Some of the uh, common bivalves uh, will go upper right and then down. Prickly cockle, smooth or Atlantic cockle, channel duck, quahog, next to it, zigzag scallop, see the ears, below it, surf clam, next to it, buttercup lucine, Below it, Cardia. Next to it, Razor Clam. Below it, Sunray Venus. Next to it, Crossbar Venus. Up, Kitten's Paw. Next to it, Asian Muscle. Below it, Jewel Box. Next to it, Coquina. Below it, Jingle Shell. Next to it, Calico Scallop. Ooh, spit on my words. Below that, Oysters. Next to it, with my hand, a tide pool full of Coquina. And then the pretty old shiny nacre of a pen shell. That's mother of pearl. That's uh, the secreting edge of the shell. Brand new shell. They're all shiny and pretty. Gastropods are the univalve, radula having snails. Complex one have lungs instead of gills because we do have land snails as well. Cone snails are venomous. Painkillers have been made from this venom, so they are um, helpful to us, a lot of these snails. 
Some of the locals, the moon snail, which is now called the shark's eye, and the horse conch, which are Florida State shell. That horse conch has beautiful orange meat. The lettered olive and the lightning whelk, only left-handed shell in our area, the lightning whelk. The queen conch is a little south of here, and the slipper snail we've uh, discussed in the, in, in, in the field. All right, upper left-hand corner, you have pear whelk with eggs. You have, next to it, the crown conch. Below it, lightning whelk, auger. Uh, below that, limpet. Next to it, you have three, one bivalve, two snails. The snails are lettered olive, auger. One below it, coquina, or the, that's the bivalve. Below that, baby's ear, moon snail, baby's ear or moon snail. Next to it, pear whelk. Next to that, mangrove, mangrove seats on the tree, mangrove periwinkle. Above that, fig. Above that, slipper snail. Our state shell with the orange meat up top. We are looking at the horse conch. Next to it, Joe Malo holding a true tulip. Above that, a little hole in a crossbar venus made by a drilling snail. Below that, the Florida fighting conch. Next to that Florida fighting conch is another Florida fighting conch with its old googly eyes. Looks like that um, SpongeBob. Bottom right hand corner, you got yourself egg casings of a lightning whelk. Upper right hand corner, alphabet cone snail. Next to it, and the last on our list, the Band or the uh, tulip, tulip eggshells, tulip eggshells. Don't know if it's a bandit or a true, but I do know they're tulip eggshells. Sea hares are our local sea slug. They're also called ink fish because if you squish them, they squirt out ink. Cephalopod means head foot. Some have the internal shell, some have no shells. There is a living fossil that has a shell, but they don't live in the Florida area. They change color for communication and camouflage. Ironically, they're colorblind. So it's pure natural selection which color works and which doesn't because they can't recognize it. Camouflage, don't get eaten, that color lives. So it's not a conscious decision. Ooh, I think I'll be pink today. They try to match texture as far as we can tell. Courtship, it's communication. Courtship displays. False eye spots help it escape predation because generally it makes them look bigger. And luck of the draw, camouflage works beautifully. You can see there's four squid in that picture, but at first glance it only looks like two. Good camouflage. Look at the cryptic coloration below, the disruptive patterns to confuse predators. The mimic octopus mimics sea snakes, starfish. It bends its body in all kinds of unique shapes to uh, mimic other creatures. The nautilus, that's a living fossil. They uh, have that shell. They're totally, totally a throwback to the um, Paleozoic, Mesozoic seas. They're what's left from the, the mass die-offs. There's a reef octopus. Uh, my friends, the fishermen, crab trappers hate them because they're contortionists. They get in, eat the crabs and leave. And there's a reef squid that I photographed uh, as well. We already talked about the Kraken in uh, one of the one of the uh, shorts that I made for one of our field trips. But uh, Arctucus, the giant squid, uh, was pictured for the first time in 2004. And these are the historic photos of that giant squid. Cuttlefish have this huge cuttle bone in them. Whereas the squid have a 
smaller C pen, many times transparent. Arthropods, there's a sea spider. We do have some spiders in Tampa Bay, I'm happy to report. Uh, there's very few marine insect spiders. Uh, there's the horseshoe crab, which is kind of alone, uh, left over from Cambrian times when trilobites were flourishing. Crustacean is by far the uh, most common class. Uh, there's sea spiders, we mentioned they don't spin webs, uh, but they have the fangs and the, you know, they're, they're spiders and they live in the intertidal zone. Chilicerata is um, our horseshoe crabs. They're the only uh, living chilicerates, have book lungs, much like, or book gills, much like spiders uh, and scorpions have book lungs. Uh, they're, they're very uh, unique. They got blue blood, copper based, uh, used in medical to test, uh, test medical equipment for uh, pollutants. Toxins. There you go. Uh, the blood is blue and that one is, it's not, they, they call it milking, but it's really bleeding. Uh, the uh, horseshoe crabs. Crustaceans now uh, are the far and away the most common, most common. Copepods are the most common in Tampa Bay. Uh, plankton, zooplankton. Uh, some of the locals uh, are lobsters, spiny and slipper lobster. They're more crayfish than lobsters. Uh, the arrow crab and blue crab are, are two, two crabs uh, we find in Tampa Bay. Arrow crab is very spider-like, but it's not a true spider. It has little pinchers, you can see. Uh, stone crab and the decorator spider crab. Fiddler crabs. Uh, the Jimmy and the she crab, you can see how you can tell the, them apart. The she crab has the Illuminati triangle, and the Jimmy has a very uh, phallic uh, genital uh, scale underneath it, genital opening. The uh, hermit crabs live in other shells, and then when they outgrow them, they go find another shell. The life cycle of crustaceans are all similar, but here's the shrimps. Uh, they move out to sea, lay eggs. The larvae are planktonic, get washed in on tides, and then they spend their life in the grass flats or wherever the uh, crustacean spends its life, but it has that gnawing stage. And then they uh, go back and they uh, migrate back and, and reproduce. So that's our shrimp. There's a big shrimp run every year where shrimp are moving out to, uh, out to sea to reproduce. But crustaceans in general have that nopolis stage in their development when they're plankton. Uh, some of our local shrimp, you can see the, the grass shrimp, the glass shrimp, and the pink shrimp. These are all taken from uh, arrowhead grass flats. Barnacles are also crustaceans. They are uh, benthic, though. They, they attach themselves to a hard surface, be it a living hard surface or a rock or a dock or wherever. The echinoderms are the spiny skinned animals with the pumped water for blood and the tube feet like little water balloons. So they move with those little water balloons that you can see. Uh, cursor, get the cursor, where is it? There it is, down here, tube feet, little uh, water balloons that inflate and deflate and allow it to uh, move around. Brittle stars are ambush hunters. They hide in the seagrass beds. Sea stars and you know starfish, very common, live brackish water to pure salt water. Very diverse, voracious hunters. They eat bivalves. They'll wrap around the bivalve and use their water pump to pry it open. And then they exude their stomach from their mouth, digest it right there in the shell, and then slurp it in. Sea urchins, 
We have the flattened sea urchin, which uh, is the sand dollar or the sea urchin. They tend to decorate themselves for camouflage. And the sea cucumber, that YouTube video is uh, well worth a watch. Uh, if you would be so kind as to watch that YouTube video in, when, in the PowerPoint, it shows a symbiote called the pearl fish. So it's a fish sea cucumber symbiotic relationship. It's a fascinating video. And then our invertebrate chordates, the tunicates, we've mentioned them a lot. Their larva resembles fish, but the adult basically is, resembles, well, some are really pretty in, in the Caribbean, but around here, chewed gum maybe. You can see them on the, on the seagrass. Um, yeah, they're, they're interesting. And then the jawless fish, it has a skull but no vertebrae, the hagfish. So there's your tunicates. You can see they're pretty in the lower left-hand corner. Ours kind of look like blobs. Uh, and the larvae are very fish-like or tadpole-like where they have a nerve cord. So they are chordata, but they're invertebrate. And the lancets as well, invertebrate, in chordata. 